Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jonathan Fiedler, and I'm the operations manager here at BISG. We're pleased that you have joined us today for our presentation in our ongoing rights education series with uh, Jeffrey Corrick of Penguin Random House uh, speaking to you about uh, permissions. Uh, many of our previous sessions have uh, stuck to a firm 30 minute um, timeline. We might go a little bit over today, but uh, we hope you stick with us and uh, ask some good questions. We'll have time at the end for, for Q&A. Please put your Q&A in the Q&A tab rather than in the chat. It just makes it easier to, um, to follow. And um, if you have to duck out early, you will receive a, a copy of this recording um, after, after the webinar. So um, right now, I'm happy to welcome uh, Jeffrey Korik um, to us. And um, thanks for being here, Jeff. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, greetings from Kansas to everybody. And thanks to Penguin Random House for letting me work remotely for the last two years and ongoing. Um, just a little bit about me. I've been involved in rights since 1986 when I was a newbie in the permissions department at Double and Company Incorporated. Uh, I've variously worked as uh, in permissions departments, uh, both at uh, book and magazine publishers. I've done freelance permissions clearance. I wrote permission software for a number of different uh, publishing houses. I've worked in rights management departments and even did brief stints in a film rights uh, department and registered copyrights for a while, which is all just to say that uh, I am an expert in absolutely nothing, but I have uh, been involved in rights for quite a while I know a little bit about most things uh, rights related. Uh, today we're doing really a basic overview of how to request permissions. Uh, my apologies if I cover territory that many of you already know, uh, but it is intended to be an introduction to requesting permissions. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, after the uh, presentation, there will be plenty of time for questions and I'm happy to answer any questions I can on anything rights related at that point. Uh, today we'll cover uh, what is permissions, that is, uh, what does a permissions department generally do? Uh, do you need to request permission for a particular product or, or, uh, or publication? Uh, or could you use be considered fair use as a public domain, et cetera? Uh, how early should you submit a request? Uh, why does it sometimes take a long time to get a response from uh, various publishers? Uh, how do I know who to ask for permissions? How do I find a rights holder? What information should you send along with your permissions request? What, need, what information does a rights holder need in order to grant a request and why? Uh, what goes into determining permissions fee? And I'll close with just some general thoughts. Uh, first of all, what is permissions? Traditionally, permissions is licensing the use of a portion of a book to be used within another book, but it can encompass an awful lot of, of other things. Uh, copies of uh, copyrighted material for classroom use, uh, second serial rights, which is uh, use of an excerpt in a magazine or other periodical after book publication, uh, TV, radio, digital broadcast rights, uh, musical setting rights, which is if you want to use a, a poem or an excerpt as lyrics uh, and set them to music, uh, performance rights, uh, dramatic readings, uh, TV, film, et cetera, uh, uses books as props in set dressing in film or television, alternative formats for print disabled individuals, and pretty much anything else you can think of. Uh, murals, tattoos, statues, hiking trail signs. I've gotten requests for all of those. Uh, I think the tattoo one was probably the most interesting. Uh, we wound up granting that as uh, fair use, one copy for personal use. Um, but all of these things really depend on what publisher you're talking to because there's no standard for what a permissions department handles. Uh, at Penguin Random House, 
uh, second serial rights may be handled by my department or by the sub rights department, depending on what imprint you're talking about. Uh, digital licensing handles the use of uh, works in uh, apps or online courses. Uh, our legal department handles commercial rights and film rights. Uh, my department handles amateur dramatic lights, but rights, but the sub rights department handles professional. Uh, and while the sub rights department usually handles any kind of reprints of full works, uh, the permissions department at PRH handles uh, full works being used in an anthology. And uh, at the various publishing houses where I've worked, it's been any combination of those things. So, uh, but generally, you can count on the permissions department to handle uh, excerpts from one book being used in another book, or generally excerpts being used in most uh, other contexts. Do I need to request permission? Um, first of all, there are the ethics of it. Uh, an author deserves to get compensated for his work. And so you should never really use anything without getting permission if the material is copyrighted. So anything where the content is protected by copyright, you should generally request permission. There are, of course, exceptions to that. The two big ones are public domain and fair use. Uh, the, a good starting point is always your publisher's legal department. They can look at your manuscript and advise uh, whether a brief excerpt or a quote you're using is they would consider fair use uh, or if something falls in the public domain. Uh, those things can get a little complicated. Uh, if you want to find out if something has fallen out of copyright, if the copyright term has expired on a piece of material you want to use, my favorite resource is the uh, Cornell Library Copyright Term website. And I've uh, uh, given you the link there at the bottom of the, uh, the slide here. Uh, copyright term in the US particularly can be really complicated and they give a really readable and easily understandable breakdown of uh, looking up what year something was originally published and how long it is likely protected by copyright. Uh, my best advice uh, is if you're in any doubt, request permission. Uh, most permissions departments are fair and, uh, and will be uh, honest if they think that something is in the public domain, uh, if they think something is fair use, they'll say so and not charge you for it. But as long as you request permission, you're covered. Um, when deciding whether to request permission, uh, just remember intellectual property is indeed property of the author. And it's never right to use someone's property without compensating them for it. Um, when you request permission from Penguin Random House, we are in effect acting as the agent for the author. So we're trying to protect the author's rights as well as our own. Uh, I mentioned that uh, copyright law in the US can be a little complex. The, not as a, I expect anyone to remember any of this, but just as an example, uh, anything uh, originally published in the United States prior to 2016, is in the public domain in the United States. From 1926 to 1963, the term of copyright is 95 years if the copyright was renewed. From 1964 to 1977, the term is 95 years, but no renewal was necessary. From 1978 on, the term of copyright is 70 years from the death of the author. And there are exceptions to all of those. Uh, it gets even more complicated outside the US. In general, in uh, uh, countries that are signatories to the Berne Copyright Convention Treaty, uh, the term of license is 70 years from the death of the author. But it's 50 years in Canada. Uh, it's 100 years in Mexico. Uh, the UK follows something called the rule of shorter term, 
where if a work is out of copyright in the country of origin, so your work is originally published in the US and it's fallen in the public domain, it's automatically in the public domain in the UK, regardless of their copyright term. So uh, I go back to what I said originally, it's always great if your published, publisher's legal department is able to act as a resource for you and help you with some of those determinations. Is my use fair use? Here we get into a real quagmire, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, fair use is the doctrine in US copyright law that permits limited use of copyrighted material without having first to acquire permission. There is no bright line. There's nothing in the copyright statute that says five pages is fair use or 10% of work is fair use. Uh, rather, the copyright statute give four factors that must be weighed in determining whether something falls under the fair use provisions. The purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted use, the amount and sustainability of the material to be used, and the effect upon a work's value. Uh, the real takeaway from this is that the only way you can really, that fair use is actually legally determined is in the course of an infringement suit. So say you feel that something is fair use, but the publisher owns or author owns the material does not, uh, nobody will really know the answer to that unless someone brings an infringement suit and a judge and jury make a final determination. That makes all this very, very iffy. Um, if you look online for what contributes, it constitutes fair use, uh, you'll find everything from one page of a full book uh, to 20% of a work, depending on who's giving their opinion, but they're all just opinions. Um, a little bit more about each of those four factors that are weighed. Uh, the purpose and character of the use. That includes whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. Now remember, no one of these factors determines something. So just because something is of an educational nature, the use, that doesn't necessarily mean it's fair use because the other three factors still have to be weighed. Uh, the nature of the use. Uh, facts are not protected by copyright. Uh, however, the, uh, for instance, uh, there was a, a famous copyright case a number of years ago where the publisher of a phone book sued uh, for copyright infringing, infringement because someone had copied their phone book. The courts determined that since a phone book is only made up of names and addresses and phone numbers, all of which are facts, that none of that material was actually covered by copyright. However, the sort of informational stuff that, you know, about this town or about our phone company, that is creative content and that is protected by copyright. Uh, next is the amount and sustainability. Uh, again, that can be interpreted many, many different ways. Uh, in there, they often look at the percentage of the full work that's to be used. You know, your is ten percent uh, fair use at fifteen, but in one famous case, uh, from President Ford's memoir, the memoir was two hundred thousand words, but the courts determined that use of less than four hundred words from that uh, did not constitute fair use because it constituted the heart of the work. It was the most important 400 words in that volume. And therefore, even though it was a minimal amount of material, the courts determined it did not constitute fair use. Uh, and the last one is the effect upon the work's value. And I've been told that that often weighs the most heavily. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but the things that are considered in, in that factor are does the usage serve as a substitute for the original work? Are you taking a full work and posting it online so nobody has to buy it? That would clearly not uh, contribute to fair use in this case. Uh, the same thing applies if you're uh, potentially damaging the market for 
sales of sub rights. Uh, for instance, uh, copy shops uh, can't produce copies for educational use because that would infringe on the publisher's ability to sell those rights. So uh, just as a couple of uh, examples, uh, you might ask, well, if I use this, am I likely to get sued? There's no way to know. That's the problem. Um, from 2015 to 2017, between 3,000 and 5,000 infringement suits were filed each year. So there are a fair number of suits going on out there. Uh, very famously, Stephen Joyce, who was James Joyce's grandson, was, to put it politely, highly protective of his work and sued at the drop of a hat. Um, in 1991, Kinko's was famously sued uh, for creating on-demand anthologies for educators without, uh, without uh, acquiring permission from the copyright holder. They lost and the settlement was $2 million. Uh, the Georgia State case, which is far more recent, went on for more than a decade. And even though it was finally largely uh, decided in favor of Georgia State, the uh, attorney's fees were not awarded to either party. So Georgia State was still out 10 years of legal fees, um, which had to have been substantial. Uh, so that's uh, why I said earlier, it's always best to apply for permission if there's really any question. How early should I submit a permissions request? Uh, and why does it take so long to get a response? Uh, the answer is, as soon as you've signed a publishing contract for your book. Uh, we often get requests from authors who have just written a manuscript and say, you know, I want to use this chapter from one of your books. Uh, can I get permission? The answer is, no, you can't until we know uh, all the information that we need in order to make a determination. Uh, we'll need to know details as to formats, print runs, pub dates, all of that before deciding whether or not we can grant a permission and on what terms it can be granted. Um, allow six to eight weeks for a response, and that is at minimum. Why so long? Uh, one, many permissions departments have a serious backlog of requests. Uh, we have a large, at PRH, we have a relatively large permission staff. There are nine of us doing nothing but permissions. Uh, many smaller publishers don't have a permissions department. Uh, permissions are handled by uh, someone in the, on the legal team or someone in the uh, contracts department as an adjunct to their regular job. Uh, it's understandable that they may take some time to get your requests. Uh, more to the point, often approval is required from an author or agent. So one of the clauses in their author contract, excuse me, an author uh, can negotiate uh, as part of that contract that they have approval over any permissions requests. And if so, then the amount of time it takes to grant a permission is entirely outside of the publisher's control. Um, I have, for instance, uh, one uh, estate of an extremely prominent author who has never once responded to our request for approval, even though we're, we're contractually obligated to get approval before granting a request. Uh, we have another major estate who always gets back to us. But the people who comprise the, uh, the estate are themselves celebrities and are very busy people. They have taken up to six months to reply to us uh, with approvals. Um, also keep in mind uh, that some permissions requests simply take longer than others. Uh, at Penguin Random House, uh, we control 430 different imprints from 68 historic companies going back to 1813. We have contracts in storage on hundreds of thousands of microfiche, 
some on index cards. Uh, we have lists of titles that we acquired from various houses uh, that are in multiple file drawers and in physical filing cabinets. Uh, so if you're looking for something that was published many years ago, it may well take the publisher a fair amount of time to, uh, to do their research necessary to determine if we even hold rights to something to an older title. Um, and lastly, uh, sometimes internal signups are required from our editorial or legal departments where we grant permissions. Those don't take as long, but they do slow down the process. How do I find the rights holder? Uh, the uh, first, uh, first stop is always the original publisher of the hardcover edition of a work. Uh, they may well still hold rights to the work. And even if they don't, they can offer, often direct you to who does. If uh, rights to a title have reverted to an author, uh, the publisher may be able to direct you to that author or to the author's agent or the estate. Uh, if the publisher can't be of help or if the publisher no longer exists, try to locate the agent for the author of the estate. It's often helpful, say, if uh, uh, your book was published by or was written by Miss Jane Doe, but the original publisher no longer exists. See if you can find other books by Miss Jane Doe. And if some current publisher is, is still publishing her work, they may well be able to put you into contact. Uh, and of course, the internet's a great resource. Authors have websites. Uh, many authors have Wikipedia pages. Uh, news articles or obituaries on the author may have clues as to where to look. Uh, even university professional affiliations uh, may help. Uh, I was searching out a rights holder a couple of years ago and uh, found that they were a board member of the American Pharmaceutical Association. And I uh, contacted the association and they eventually uh, put me in contact with the rights holder. Uh, sometimes you do have to get a little creative. If you're doing a really large project, say an anthology, a poetry anthology that may uh, include several hundred poems, it may well be worth your time uh, to hire a professional permissions clearance services service. There are many out there. Uh, some, excuse my interruption here. Uh, some are better than others, but uh, all of them uh, will do all this permissions clearance for you. They'll try and locate rights holders. Uh, they'll do all the grunt work of uh, uh, submitting all the requests, uh, collating all the responses. And for a large, a large project, uh, it can be well worth the money. And uh, BISG currently has an initiative that's ongoing to create a list of imprints, both current and historic, and who controls rights to those imprints. Um, and this is something that we hope that anybody on this call who is a uh, uh, affiliated with a publisher, you can help. Um, we're looking for what imprints does a publishing house control? And particularly, we're looking for what historic imprints that you control. Imprints that may not still be publishing, may not be current, but to which you still hold rights to the content. If you contact BSG at info at bsg.org, they can tell you exactly what information we need. Uh, this will be uh, made publicly available as a resource for anybody who is looking up an obscure imprint like say Kirbichi Freed or Dodd Mead or uh, uh, there are thousands of them and needs to find out what publisher currently controls rights to most of those titles. So I hope you'll get involved in that. What information does the publisher or rights holder need? And, or in other words, what information do you provide to a rights holder or a publisher when submitting your request? First, they'll need information about the book from which you used to, from which you, you wish to use, excuse me, material. <clears throat> only the title, author, editor, translator, and if possible, the ISBN of the book in which the material was originally published. Make sure you don't uh, 
find a short story that's been used in a collection and say, well, I need to use this short, short story from collective stories published by Houghton Mifflin, but I think the story originally originated with Benjamin Random House. Uh, we will need to know the title author and the information about the book in which the, the excerpt originally appeared. Make sure you identify the exact material you wish to use. You can't just say, I need to use 300 words from this book. We need to know which 300 words. So give us page numbers. Uh, if it's a poem or a short story, give us the title. Uh, any information, if it's a figure, give us the figure number. Most helpful. Um, and it's always helpful if you include a photocopy of the material you requested from the original source book. What information does a publisher need about your book? Uh, they'll need your publisher's address and email. They'll need to know what format your book was going to be published in, print, ebook, audio, whatever. Uh, the planned print run or estimated users for each format. So you'll need to say, I'm going to do you know, 50,000 in hardcover. Uh, we plan to sell uh, 10,000 ebooks and uh, uh, 15,000 audiobooks. If you don't know those numbers, then you may well not. I mean, who knows how many ebooks you may wind up selling. Uh, then you need to tell us how many you want how many copies or users you want any resulting license to cover. Uh, and obviously the more you ask for, the more permissions license is likely to cost. Uh, they'll need to know the tentative list price for each uh, uh, format of your book, tentative publication date, the total number of pages in your book, the territory in which you plan to distribute your work, US, worldwide, uh, the languages in which you intend to publish your book currently, not when it, may, when it may be published in the future, but what the current publishing plans are, and some brief information of just about your book and usage. Uh, an anthology of world literature for grades four through six is great. Uh, but be sure and note if you anticipate any other ancillary uses, are you planning both a student edition or a teacher's edition? Are you uh, doing a pamphlet that you also want to post online or on Facebook? Any usage that you're intending to make of the material needs to be covered in your request. Uh, and keep in mind that if a request has to go out for approval, an agency may ask for even more. They ask, may ask for a table of contents or a list of other authors in the collection. They want, might want a copy of the excerpt in context as it's going to appear in your book. Uh, if it's a request uh, from an educational institution for photocopies for classroom use, an agent may ask for the instructor's name, the course name, what semester. Uh, so in general, give us all the information you can. The more you give us, the less likely we're going to have to go back and forth and delay your request by asking you for additional information. Why do we need all of that information? Uh, the first uh, reason is that we may not control the rights you need. Uh, we may control uh, audio but, or uh, print, but not audio or uh, electronic, but not print. Uh, we may, may not hold rights in the UK and Commonwealth uh, or in other territories. Uh, and we'll refer you to who we believe does so they'll hold those rights. Author may have played, re, placed certain restrictions on their work, uh, I'll only allow permissions to be granted for educational use, or I won't allow my work to be used in anthology. But the real reason that we need most of that material is in order to help determine a fee uh, or whether a fee will be involved at all. Uh, just as an example, uh, we have one work, well, a series of works actually by a prominent uh, Spanish language author that have been translated into English. Uh, the US rights in the US, Canada, and UK are all controlled by different publishers. 
audio rights are controlled by the agent for the estate. Two of the translators for the book have retained permission rights. So even though you'd have to get the underlying rights to the author's original material from us, you would have to go to those two uh, translators if you wanted to use poems translated by either or both of them. So there could be six different parties you need to apply to for permission for two poems from one work. So as long as you tell us everything up front that you need, we'll be more likely to be able to send you the right place for all of the rights you need. What goes into determining a permission fee? Uh, there are lots of different things. Uh, most publishers and certainly PRH, I can speak from experience, do their best to determine a fee that's fair and reasonable, both to the author and to the requester. Uh, Penguin Random House and most publishers sort of sit in the middle of this process because we are both a consumer and a vendor of permissions. So we never want to charge a fee that's going to be outlandish because we wouldn't want people to charge us outlandish fees, but we do need to be fair to our authors and try and get them on a reasonable amount if their work is being used. To determine a free fee, uh, we uh, look at the nature of the usage, a nonprofit non or charitable use, or additions for print disabled individuals make it special fee consideration. Uh, what is the material being requested? Uh, if it's an iconic work or an iconic author, those may command higher fees. Uh, how much material is being requested? We're obviously not going to charge as much to use one page as we are to use 100 pages. How many copies are being distributed and at what price? Uh, again, if you're making 10 copies, it's going to be a very different fee than if you're making 500,000. Uh, how many formats are being licensed? Will the license include translation to other languages? For instance, are you doing a dual language edition? And how long will the term of license continue? Uh, will this permission be valid for one year, for five years, for 10 years? All of those things go into considering a fee. And a lot of people ask, you know, how much permissions cost? There's no real way to answer that question. Uh, permissions fees are highly subjective. Uh, and for instance, our fee schedule is immensely complicated. We take all of the factors I mentioned into consideration. And so there's no one answer to how much is the permissions going to cost. Um, also, permissions fees being subjective vary widely depending on who you're asking. Uh, whether you're asking an author, uh, a publisher, an agent, an estate, or a music company, uh, fees are going to be wildly different. Uh, as I said, we try and hit the middle of the road. Uh, some authors are just happy for their work to, to reach a wider audience. Uh, estates, and especially music publishing companies, are notorious for charging high fees. Uh, if you want to use a, a few lyrics from a Beatles song or an Eagles song, uh, be prepared that for a little bit of uh, sticker shock. And lastly, just a few things that I thought might be helpful. Uh, don't ask the impossible. Uh, we often get uh, requests saying, uh, I want uh, right, all rights in all formats in all languages in perpetuity. Uh, we simply send it back and, and say, no, <laughs> we can't grant that uh, for a lot of reasons. We may not, may not hold all those rights. Uh, if uh, there are going to be translations, we'll want to know the publishing details of the publisher of the foreign edition. Uh, we can't often grant rights in perpetuity because some of our author contracts are themselves term limited. Uh, so asking for all rights in all languages in perpetuity is just going to delay your request. Uh, don't request rights that you don't reason reasonably expect to need. Uh, the more rights you request and uh, the greater the scope of those rights, the more a permissions fee is going to cost. There's no reason to pay for rights that you don't need or that you're not avail uh, eventually going to use. 
uh, if you uh, ask for a print run of 20,000 copies and you find out later, oh, we're going to need to do another printing, you know, just come back and ask for more. Uh, it's not a big deal. And there's no reason to pay for 100,000 copies if you only have a 20,000 uh, printing. Uh, and lastly, it never hurts to ask in the case the permissions fee comes back as more than you can handle. Um, we may say no, we may say no, we think that's a uh, perfectly reasonable fee and, and we uh, can't for whatever reason uh, adjust that, uh, but sometimes we can. And it's also perfectly acceptable to make a counter offer. Um, there's also something that uh, is called the Most Favored Nations Clause, where uh, the editor of a large uh, collection of poetry or short stories uh, may say, here's our request, and we simply can't afford to pay more than X amount of money for each item, for each poem that's appearing in this volume. And we promise that nobody that's included in this volume, we won't pay any more than this amount. Uh, in which case we may agree to that amount. We may say, we may uh, include a most favored, favored nations clause in the license that says, we're granting you this at this price on the condition that nobody else uh, is getting more for their inclusion in the work. And that pretty much wraps up what I ha have to say, uh, except that I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, BISG. Uh, I've been involved with BISG for a number of years. It's a great organization, and I highly encourage any of you to get more involved. Uh, BISG is sometimes involved in setting best practices or standards, and it's great to have a voice in that process. Uh, but more for me, it's been a great learning experience. I've been uh, exposed to an awful lot of uh, folks from other publishing houses that I would have met, I've learned from all of them, and it's a great networking opportunity. So I highly encourage folks to get involved. And that's what I have to say, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions that anyone may have. Thank you so much for that, Jeff, and uh, especially for the praise uh, of the ASG. Um, Everyone you see on this final slide, some upcoming webinars, you can find more information about those on the BISG website and more information on getting involved in the, um, <clears throat> in the rights committee. We, um, we do have some questions, Jeff, and um, you know, <clears throat> from, from Kelly is, is a little bit, a bit of an offshoot of the uh, notion of, uh, of fair use and uh, a question about you know only quoting you know one sentence from from a work if it's included in the, in the bibliography and I, I you know I think I know the answer here but why don't why don't you uh, speak a little bit about um, you know you, you you say it's always good to to ask for permission but you know is is there a true threshold where you know there you really must and um, there really is a threshold um, for instance as I mentioned from the uh, heart of the matter case. That was a you know a famous copyright case. That case, 400 words, which is really just about a page of material, was not considered fair use. Uh, fair, it's often not considered to be fair use if that sentence is set apart in any way. For instance, a sentence uses an epigraph uh, generally is not considered fair use by you know most publishing houses. Although I don't know the case law on it. Um, if, uh, if you're doing, say, a uh, calendar and you want to use a quote on the uh, uh, quote a month for each month on the calendar, that would in no case be fair use, no matter how minimal the material was. But in, in terms of citing, you know, citing facts and, and scientific studies that were in a, in a previous work, that's, that's normally not a case where you would need to ask for permission. No, as long as all you are stating are facts, regardless of where or when they were published, you know, uh, uh, Sherman uh, burned Atlanta in 1864. Doesn't matter where you got that information, that's a fact. And you're free to use it in any way you like. 
Um, we, we also have a question here, um, and I'm gonna combine two questions from, from Susan and, and Kim together. Um, and I think you can see them also, but um, you know, are, the, are the permission processes exactly the same for, for images? And then, then an offshoot of that is, you know, if an image is, is um, granted for, for use on, on a book cover, is, is it understood by a, uh, by a grantor um, that that book cover is also going to be used in, in marketing materials and is, is the marketing of, of that image so one and the same? Um, but remind me of the first part of that question. I already spaced it out. Sorry. Now, yes, no. Oh, so just okay. the, 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 the first part is just, you know, is, is the permissions process um, for, oh, the same for, for, Im images. For, for images the same for, as for text? Yeah, uh, largely, yes. Uh, if you're uh, looking to use an image from one of our works, we're going to want to know the same information, you know, exactly which images, what, what pages they appear on, how many images, are they illustrations, are they uh, photographs, um, and the process is going to be identical. Um, something that uh, one should be careful of, though, is always check the copyright page and the acknowledgement page of the, the work in which the material originally appeared. If it says something like used by courtesy of or used by permission of, then you are probably asking the wrong person. If the, if the image or, or even a quotation or uh, any material that you want to use is credited elsewhere, that's the party for, to whom you need to apply for permission. Uh, in the case of book covers, uh, the use of, say you've licensed, uh, say Penguin Random House has licensed to photograph to be used as a component of a book cover. Uh, we would always license it, uh, an, any component of a book cover uh, with the expectation and spelled out in the licensing agreement that we can use that book cover for promotional use uh, without limitation. Uh, however, if someone comes to us and wants to use an image off of a book cover, we often can't license it. We may have uh, license that image from Getty or one of the uh, uh, large uh, you know, uh, photo agencies, and we can't relicense that. Uh, if the cover of the book is being used it, intact as a whole and not being modified in any way, and the usage is promotional in nature, then we can let that book cover be used but we often and generally can't uh, license components of a book cover separately. Thank you. Um, we're also gonna welcome Chris Kleeman here. Chris is the chair of the BISG Rights Committee and uh, is instrumental in the, in the work that Jeff was speaking about, including the directory of, of imprint owners. And um, thanks for joining us, Chris, to um, flesh out some, um, some more questions. Oh, yeah, um, I do want to say th that the rights committee is kind of fun, so I hope more people <laughs> come and join us. Um, we do a lot of interesting things, and uh, the kind of questions that come up um, and the kind of work we're trying to do that advances, raises the boat for everybody um, is really worthwhile participating in. Uh, I wanted to go back to Kelly's question for just a second about citing scientific articles perhaps in books or other journal articles. There is an association of scientific technical medical publishers that have a, um, a kind of group agreement about how to uh, handle permissions. And if you're not familiar with that group, um, I suggest you look at scientific stm.org, I believe it is, and look into the permissions uh, area there. And there'll be some explanations about how they work together. Um, generally speaking, you know, advancing scientific um, research is a goal for all of the publishers in that area, and they do exchange freely. Um, you know, Jeff, I just wanted to say, I thought a lot of the information you offered is so valuable and um, people don't always realize that <clears throat> uh, in, in a trade publishing situation, often the burden of clearing permissions is on the author. Correct. Um, but the author should, uh, 
should be talking to her publisher <laughs> for some of those kinds of details. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you probably do get some requests from authors who don't yet have a publisher, right? We do. And, yeah. and in most cases, we mm -hmm. simply have to tell them, uh, come back when you do have a publisher. Uh, be, now, the only exception to that is it would be if an author is self-publishing, you know, whether on Amazon or elsewhere, uh, in which case they are at the point of publishing. So it is the time to request permissions, but they won't necessarily know many of the publishing details. And in that case, what we always tell them is then you have to decide what terms you want to license for. How many copies do you want to license? What formats are you, do you want to publish in? And just keep in mind that, you know, licensing for 100,000 copies is going to cost a lot more than licensing for 10,000 copies. So only license, only ask for a licensed cover as much as you reasonably expect to sell. Uh, if, if your book turns out to be the next, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey, dandy. You can come back and ask for more copies then and, and we'll happily issue a, another license or an amendment. So you do get those second requests from sure. people and, and, sure. and work through. Um, how often are you granting on time spans instead of print runs? Is that is it possible to do that kind of, you know, instead of print and user, uh, do a kind of unlimited for a period of time or does that just not fly? Uh, there are a number of answers to that. First of all, yeah. I'm only answering for PRH. Uh, it differs widely among, you know, depending on who you're asking permissions from, what they will and won't grant. Uh, we have a firm uh, policy at PRH that all of our permissions licenses are limited both by number of copies and by term of license. And by so you will be, uh, you know, granted you can produce up to so many copies or so many ebook users for a period of, and our maximum term is 10 years. Uh, and, you know, once either of those are exhausted, then you have to reapply. Right. Uh, however, that's changed in the, you know, over the course of time I've been uh, involved in the industry. Uh, it used to be pretty much the norm that uh, uh, everybody was granting for just a term of license. There, there, there weren't copy limits generally, say, 20 years ago. But as print runs started to get larger and larger, and people started to look at them and say, well, this is really unfair. Uh, this one's doing 5,000 copies over a five-year term of license. And this other company is doing now two or 300,000. Uh, we need to have a way to differentiate and to, to not charge that 20,000 person as much as that half a million person. Right, right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, we, we have one more question that's, that's popped in here, a, a specific question that um, some people might be familiar with, but others not, but uh, you, you can expand upon it, Jeff. Is, about the, is the Copyright Clearance Center a, a useful resource for, for, for permissions? I, I, I think I know that you know, sometimes they, they will not control permission mm -hmm. for, for, for publishers, but maybe Chris and, and, and Jeff, you can speak about the Copyright Clearance Center and, and their role in. Sure. Uh, the Copyright Clearance Center's role varies depending on what publisher you're talking about, because the Copyright Clearance Center offers numerous different products and publishers can opt in or out of any or all of them. Uh, at Penguin Random House, uh, we use the Copyright Clearance Center only for copies for classroom use or electronic reserve for classroom use. Uh, and they can't handle all of our titles. For instance, Copyright Clearance Center can't handle any of our tires, titles that require author approval. Uh, for any of those, you'd have to come directly to us. Uh, but if you're a, uh, an educational institution or a teacher and you need uh, you know, 30 copies of uh, Catcher in the Rye or whatever for classroom use, you can go to the Copyright Clearance Center and they would license on our behalf. Uh, I should also mention that uh, fees for, copy of, for copies for classroom use are not, uh, we don't consider those proprietary. Uh, nor are they complicated. We charge 20 cents per copy per page. Copyright Clearance Center charges exactly the same amount if you license our material through them. Uh, other publishers use Copyright Clearance Center for all of their licensing. Uh, they don't have a permissions department and Copyright Clearance Center 
happily handles all of that for them. Uh, so what the uh, CCC's role is really depends on, on the publisher involved. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think the one important thing to know is that it's not, uh, if, if Copyright Clearance Center is involved uh, in um, permissioning some of your content, you can also still be permissioning some of your content. It's not an exclusive thing. Um, there are other use. There are other uses that um, CCC will clear in a very efficient way that could um, enable you to spend more time thinking about the more profound permission questions that come <laughs> up. Um, and I will just say that again, going back to my STM experiences, the the use of the rights link widget on most most publishers' uh, website on articles and. Um, and graphs and charts uh, there, their automatic permission sort of widget is extremely helpful. You set some automatic pricing. Uh, it's very common on the big STM publisher uh, content sites and um, permissions can happen in very high volume in that way. That's I think really helpful. Um, so, so yes, uh, the answer, the short answer is yes, CCC is helpful. Um, and it, there are different ways in which CCC is helpful. Well, and CCC's process is uh, largely automated, which means they are in a position to often uh, get a permission, you know, license back much faster than any publisher can that's, that's uh, uh, doing everything essentially by hand. Right, and uh, and to clarify, you set the prices. The publishers or the rights holders set, set the prices. Price. It's not a CCC price; it's a publisher right. price. And um, yeah. as Jeff mentioned, often for certain situations, it's the same price that you would get from a from a publisher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. we we try not to have any differentiation. Depend, yeah, you know, whether you get the rights from CCC or from us. Uh, but if you're using, uh, as I say, you they only handle our. Uh, copies for classroom use. If you want to use uh, the material in any other way, then CCC is, cannot help on a bit of a random stuff. Right. Well, we, um, we can I, Jonathan, I just want to say one more plug for that rights holder imprint uh, um, directory that we're working on, because I know that it's, uh, for people seeking permission, it can be a long slog. First first step is always finding out who holds the rights. And when you have a book in your hand, as Jeff said, that says Dodd Mead, it might not be that easy for you to figure out where that is now if you're not an old publishing hand like we are. So uh, we will put publish this directory and make it available um, so that rights seekers, permission seekers can easily find you. Um, so we'd appreciate publishers participating in adding to this list of of um, imprints that they now own, that whose titles they've now incorporated. So that's info at bisg.org, and uh, yes. you'll some help on what to what to uh, supply so that we can provide that information. And if and if anybody is is just hearing about this notion of the of the directory for the first time, and uh, just write to info at bisg.org, and uh, we can fill in. Um, fill in the gaps in terms of what we're talking about and, and what you can submit because we want this to be a resource for the, the entire industry and uh, the more people involved, the uh, the more comprehensive and the more useful it's going to be. And I, I'll just add to that, that to try and maintain the accuracy and integrity of the list, we're only adding imprints to the list when we've been told by a publisher or a representative of a publisher that they own those imprints. Uh, because the publishing houses themselves are really the only ones who know what imprints they own. So we need this information to come uh, directly from you folks who are, you know, parts of publishing houses. Well, I think we are out of questions and we're almost at the top of the hour. So Jeff, thank you so much for your presentation. Well, Chris, thanks. thank you for, thank you for jumping in and expanding and, and contributing and helping me with uh, Q and A. This has been a uh, wonderful, a wonderful session. And um, anyone who who missed the beginning, um, you will be getting a, a copy of the recording. So don't despair. And uh, thank you for joining us.